as a babysitter. Uh, and my mother would plop me down and she would say, it's the Adams family, it's the Adams family. And, and I watched it. My favorite character, of course, was Lurch. Um, don't know what it was. I think it was just, uh, this was a, Ted Cassidy was an actor who practiced and demonstrate, demonstrated restraint as opposed to anything overt. And I was fascinated by that. I was also fascinated by the makeup. Uh, which was done by a gentleman by the name of Norman Prinkle. He is the man who originated and designed the makeup of Ted Cassidy in the Adams family. Um, so that was it as a, as a child, uh, you know, the Adams family. And then, of course, as I got older, I saw Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and saw all of his other stuff. And certainly, well, I was a fan of the Incredible Hulk. And of course, Ted, we know, passed away in 1979. So in mid of several seasons of The Incredible Hulk, which meant that, now he had already done his work in terms of the opening, um, not opening credits, but the opening of the show, you'll hear his narration, talking about uh, Dr. David Banner. Um, but also Ted Cassidy voiced uh, the Incredible Hulk. He voiced, he did the voice grunting and groaning. I'll tell you a quick story I remember. <laughs> Sean Cassidy, his son, and I'll talk about Sean uh, quite a bit today. Um, but he was talking about how he, as a boy, he was able to go into the studio during one of the recording sessions of The Incredible Hulk. So they put up a film up there, and you can see Lou Ferrigno doing his stuff and jumping down. and. And basically, it's all silent, you know. And so Ted was at his microphone and and did something like this. <laughs> and then the directors behind the, the booth looked at him and said, it's perfect, beautiful. We don't need to do that again. We, we got it. You know, and Sean tells that story. It's funnier when he tells it that he was just like, are these people kidding? What that? How do you qualify? How do you quantify that that was good or well done as opposed to just mediocre grumbling? Um, so that's uh, a little bit about Sean and a little story about the Incredible Hulk. Um, but ostensibly, I'm guessing what, what most people have asked me, of course, is, where did you, why did you, why? Why did you do this? Why did anyone need to do this? And this is a true story. Um, March of 2020, the world sort of changed for us all. You might remember that, I don't know. Um, and the pandemic threw us into quarantine, obviously. And so I had a little extra time on my hands. So I love to read as well, and I love to read nonfiction, and I love horror nonfiction. So it's a very niche type of thing. And I also love to read about circus acts and strange freak show people, you know. And that was a long time ago. You could call someone a freak, and it was OK. Um, and I love to read about actors who really challenge themselves by doing donning lots of bizarre makeups and strange clothes and creating these characters from the outside in. Um, which is something that Lawrence Olivier used to talk a lot about. You know, you look at someone like James D. Marlon Brando, uh, who were from the actor studio tradition, they emoted from the inside out. It was a very American 1950s thing to do. And Olivier, of course, loved to attach things to his face and create these characters. Well, Ted Cassidy was able to encompass all of Lurch, a powerful character. Um, and when he entered the room, they said, you, you know, your eyes immediately went to Ted. Of course, he was six foot nine. But I started looking at that time for a biography on Ted Cassidy. I'm, I'm looking because I really want to read more about him, six foot nine, with this incredible basso profundo voice. And uh, I couldn't find anything. Went to Amazon, Google, 
went to the library. There's, there's, I couldn't find the book that clearly someone would have written a biography on Ted since he died in 79, and he was a cultural icon. Where is that book? It didn't exist. No one had done it. It just sort of slipped everyone's mind, I guess. Um, and so, as has been told me in the past, write what you would like to read. And I love that. And so that's what I did. I said, well, I, I, let me see if I can write this book. Maybe I can write the biography of Ted Cassidy. Four years later, it was finished. And it wasn't that I was at it every single day for four years. I took very long breaks and did other projects as well. Um, that's why it took me so long. The next book I write will not take me four years. I'm just not going to do it. It's hard to maintain that sort of momentum, even for a topic that you love so much, like I did with Ted Cassidy. Any questions? Do you want to know what should we talk about where he came from? Sure. Yeah. Well, let's start from the beginning. Okay. Um, Assume we know nothing other than Lurch. Okay. Excellent. How did you get into acting? I mean, I okay. Know, very, very good. I didn't know he was the narrator on The uh, Incredible Hulk, so I didn't yeah. know he had a Rasu Profundo voice. Yes, yes. Um, so, uh, Ted Cassidy was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in uh, 1932. And his uh, father was uh, a tool maker and auto mechanic. His mother was into education and uh, nursing. And so they lived in Pittsburgh during the Great Depression. And they did everything they could for Ted. He was not living in squalor, but he certainly was not the wealthiest of children. Um, this, this was a hardworking family, hardworking Irish ancestors from immigrants who had come hundreds of years previously to the U.S. And Ted was born normal weight and height for, for a baby, and as he grew up, two, three, four, five, around six or seven, certainly around six, the age of six or seven, he began showing these uh, unusual growth spurts. And so he began to get taller and taller. And certainly by the time he was eight or nine years old, he was taller than the rest of his fellow uh, classmates and taller than most kids that age. And certainly taller than most kids in Philippi, West Virginia, which is where the Cassidy moved after about six years of being in, in Pittsburgh. Um, so that's where Ted grew up, Philippi, West Virginia. I was just there last weekend uh, to his birthday, uh, of course, is July 31st. And so they have a big thing called Lurch Fest in Philippi where they, they celebrate Ted Cassidy because he's, yeah, it's a wonderful thing. He is uh, their native son. And so, uh, this started four years ago, and I missed the first year because I just didn't know about it. And then uh, the second year of Lurch Fest, I attended doing reconnaissance and doing research on my topic. And then the third year of Lurch Fest, my second, um, I had hoped to have the book ready, but it just wasn't. So I still went, and I had a vendor booth, and I sold some of my other books. And then finally this year, it came four years later, fourth year of Lurchfest, and the 60th anniversary of the Adams family. Uh, 1964, it debuted. Um, it's also a special, special date for me as well, because I debuted about a week before the Adams family debuted in 1964. Um, so this is a big year. So in Philippi, West Virginia, remember, the Great Depression is still going on, and they are doing everything they can to try to live a life of normalcy, like everyone was doing at that time. Um, war bonds were very big. Uh, supporting the war effort was big. Um, the economy always gets a boost in the US, typically, uh, because people are going back to work to build machinery, uh, ammo, and 
all sorts of things for the war effort, uh, as well as the military. And um, Ted grew up during this time, and he had certainly, here's the other thing, by the time he was six years old, he had moved up two grade levels. Ted Cassidy was not just someone who was used in stunt casting, where they needed a big, ugly oak to, to walk in and, you know, grunt around. He did that his entire career. He didn't like it very much after a while. But he was a brilliant man, and he really wanted to play the roles of doctors and lawyers and geniuses and scientists and all that. It passed him by because of typecasting. Um, but in Philippi, he was a smart, smart kid, so he moved up very quickly in his middle school and his high school. He played basketball, of course, we know that. Um, he loved to swim. He was a very, very good swimmer, and there was a special place out. Uh, just on the outskirts of Philippi where there is a rock that you can actually swim around and there's a place where you can swim under that rock and it is said that Ted spent a lot of his boyhood days there swimming in the swimming hole. So this was middle America. This is just basically, you know, growing up as normal as one possibly can uh, during the economic circumstances such as they were. Um, Ted was very interested in reading. He read a lot and he loved words. So, and he was also called Teddy when he was younger. So as he grew older, he began to read plays. He began to read novels. And he started doing some school plays in high school. When he went off to Wesleyan University, that was in Buckhead. That's when he was doing a lot of basketball and a little bit of theater, but he matriculated after two years to Stetson University in Deland, Florida. We believe he did this because the opportunities he felt would be greater for him there. Uh, they had a big, wonderful theater program, really a good one, and uh, a great sports program. This is very funny. I told this story last weekend, but as I was doing research about this particular period of time, which was the 1950s, um, Ted is at Stetson University, a beautiful campus, by the way. I was able to go through their archives and, and dig through old playbills, which is just for a nerd like me, that was just really wonderful. Um, but so Ted is at Stetson University and he's at West, uh, Wesleyan. Uh, Wesleyan for two years, Stetson took him about three to finish. And I'm looking at the schedule and I'm doing all my detective work and I'm trying to figure something out. And I could see where he was playing basketball games and doing plays, first semester, second semester. And then there's a third semester, okay. And then fourth semester, I can't see anything. I can't find anything, it's a missing, period of time, which is bizarre for me. And no one's ever told me anything about a missing period of time in Ted Cassidy's life. You go into his later years at Stetson and everything is there as though he returned. Where was he? What happened? Well, he was a prankster. And uh, Ted and his buddy went to, uh, they used to have on Sunday nights, it's very similar. I went to Winter College and we had things like this, but Sunday evenings they would gather the students together into the cafetorium, and you would just dress up in your coat and your tie, and the ladies would wear their noodle skirts and whatever else that they wore at that time. And there was a sign out front that said, you know, shirts, ties, jackets required for men. And uh, Ted turned to his friend and he said, let's just take off our shoes. Why don't we just take off our shoes and our socks and go barefoot? So they're walking into a place where you're going to be eating, first of all, eating food. And they walk in and the entire cafeteria explodes with laughter. Everybody's loving it. It's like a scene out of a film. And uh, they walk around barefoot. They go and get their tray. They sit down, pull up their pants. They're barefoot as they're eating. So it was really funny during that period of time, during that day, they got a lot of laughs. Um, the following day, it earned them a front row seat at the dean's office. And uh, both young men were summarily um, 
not expelled, but they were suspended. So Ted Cassidy was suspended for one year, and no one knew this until I dug wow. deep and found the information. Really bizarre. That's so excessive. <laughs> well, at the time, it certainly. Well, yes, I agree with you. Walking barefoot into the. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah, you can give the community service picking up trash for a month or something. You don't expel them, you don't suspend them. That's what they did at the time. Wow. So Ted took that time to yeah. go to Daytona Beach and spend time there learning to be a lifeguard. So he got his certification. And there are incredible photographs of Ted with his fellow buds, and they're all shirtless and looking like these perfect built bodies. And in the middle of all these guys that are in front of the uh, lifeguard van, they used to drive these big trucks under the sand. Um, there's Ted, and he's just towering over everyone else. Blonde, blonde hair from the sun. Um, incredible photographs, uh, and those made it into the book as well. Oh, sure. yeah. um, one thing I'll say, a lot of people have asked, and this is something that became flawed common knowledge, and that is Ted's condition. What, what, what was the deal with him? And this is the biggest surprise, the biggest takeaway from the book. So if I were to go on the Today Show, that would be wonderful. Um, and talk about the book, it would be because, and they would tout it as, as tout me as having new information, new information about Ted Cassidy. That information is this. Um, a news platform in Australia put it out that Ted had acromegaly, that he was diagnosed with acromegaly, something we also call gigantism, um, a condition affected by the pituitary gland when too much of one thing is being produced, in short. And so Ted certainly was a very tall man. Ted was a very heavy man. Ted had a very deep voice, and he had a lantern-shaped jaw. The family maintains that Ted was never diagnosed with acromegaly, and they maintain to this day he did not have acromegaly. So it's a big deal only for those people who are convinced that he did and who are hardcore Ted Cassidy fans. Um, but that's in the book. And acromegaly is more like what Rondo Hatton had. Rondo Hatton had acromegaly, that's correct. Uh, you know, no, 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 nothing about Ted was disproportionate, particularly. He was no, just, that's he was correct. Just, he was just huge. That's absolutely correct. That's right. Um, and Sean Cassidy has a story of where he went to the doctors as Ted's son and uh, maybe a couple of years ago, and he saw that the doctor had written down acromegaly on his slip. Now, Sean is a very tall man as well, looks a lot like his dad. He's not quite, he's not 7'9". Um, and he challenged the doctor, he said, what are you writing down? He said, well, you, acromegaly, you clearly have this, right? And he was like, no, I do not, my father did not. Um, so that's been a point of contention with the Cassidy family. Um, and I think kind of interesting. Um, do you all know who played Thing? I think you all know who played Thing. Yeah, in the original? That would be Ted Cassidy, that's right. So in the original, uh, Adam's family, this was kept a secret for a very long time. Um, and then Sean Cassidy believes it may have been him who finally let the cat out of the bag or the hand out of the box, as it were. But. Um, What's interesting is when you watch the Adams family, what's great are to watch those scenes where Lurch and Thing are in the room at the exact same time. Because clearly, Ted wasn't doing the hand at that time. What they did is they just used anyone nearby who was unencumbered. So a, a, a man, I don't think they used females. They, wanted, they, they were like, well, we will never find a hand quite as large as Ted's, but it needs to be masculine. So um, that's what they did. Um, the people who played the thing, um, Jack Vaudlin, who was the assistant director for the Adams family, he played thing at one time. Uh, Sean Cassidy was there and says that stagehands would do it. And a couple of times, John Aston played thing. People don't know that. John Aston was originally considered and cast to play 
the butler in the Adams family. That changed. Uh, yeah, John, uh, John Aston would have been the lurch character. Of course, it changed a lot since uh, David Levy, the producer, looked at what he wanted to do and looked at his cast of characters and looked at John Aston. So obviously the role of Gomez went to John Aston. And there are about three different accounts of how Ted Cassidy got cast as Lurch. So all three of them are there. One of them has to be true. So, but I put them there side by side and, and speak a little bit about the fact that we don't know with absolute certainty how he did, but we know that he did and had a real favorable meeting and audition with David Levy. You must all know by now the, the, uh, the story about how you rang came about, the fact that Ted Lurch became verbal. He wasn't at first, and Ted was cast simply for his look and his ability to move across the floor as he did, and his, his expressions were phenomenal. Everything beneath the makeup, as I said before, it didn't cover up what he was doing, it revealed who he was doing, and that was what was so amazing. Um, but um, I haven't had enough coffee, so I forgot my train of thought. We were talking about what? You were talking you rang. Thank you very much. Um, so Ted is going in there, and it's day one, and they're working on everything. And uh, just as a fluke, he decided he would say the words, you rang, as he showed up after the, the bell noose was rung. And everyone completely cracked up. Everyone just died laughing. Also because that's Ted's voice, but that's not his, that wasn't his regular speaking voice. But he was able to drop it an octave in order to play this role. And so when he did that, people just died laughing. And from then on, you rang and, yes, Mrs. Adams, and yes, Mr. Adams. Those became part and parcel of what Lurch would say every day. But because of Ted's abilities and the fact that he could act really well, and, and his voice was so amazing, they decided to write scripts for him. And so there are at least three that are lurch centric, I like to say. What else? What else can we talk about? No, that was Richard No, Keel. Richard Keel. And here's the deal with that. Ted Cassidy in the 70s, uh, especially right after, obviously, uh, not for Russia with love, not for your eyes only, the spy who loved me when Jaws first appears, uh, people would make that mistake and they would tell Ted, I loved you in um, the James Bond films. And he was furious. He hated hearing that because he was being compared to someone else who he claimed and felt was just playing a big oaf. And Ted really prided himself on his acting ability. Remember, he was classically trained. He was doing Shakespeare back at Stetson. University. Um, so no, he didn't do that. Also, I believe there's an actor named Jack Halloran or Jack O'Halloran, oh, who was in uh, the Superman movies. It's one of the three criminals. Oh, yeah. and, uh, Ted was often mistaken to have played that role as well. Yeah, he, he did not. Right. Yeah. I, I never made that mistake. No, no, nor did I, but apparently it's, it's a thing. Okay, then how about uh, to serve man? No, Richard Keel. Jeez. Okay. <laughs> Richard Keel. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, 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 I've done some bad service to you. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Um, he's gone. He's dead. Um, but we try to keep his memory and, and his his service uh, to television and film and radio alive. My goodness, speaking of radio and his amazing voice, as Sean Cassidy puts it. If there was a villain in any Hanna-Barbera cartoon that was played by Ted Cassidy, and these were referred to as the seize them roles, because he always had to say, seize them, and he got really tired of it, really tired of it. So um, the thing about his career, it is wrong to say that he hated playing Lurch. This is not altogether true. What he tired of was after the first season, 
feeling as though he was being ill-used as just a walking prop. So later on in season two, he begins getting really tired, and we can see this, and he's getting kind of bored because he starts doing other shows. He starts doing the guest appearances. So um, by the time the end of 1966 came, he had done Star Trek, of course, uh, Lost in Space, and a few others as well. Uh, Mighty Mouse. Um, so he had a lot, a lot of with Michael Dunn. He, with Michael Dunn, now that would have been interesting. I, I don't know about that. My, again, my the major emphasis, although I looked at the entirety of his career, I stopped the book at 1966. So I'm I'm that guy. If you need to find out about Ted Cassidy from birth to 1966, from cradle to creature, then I may have some answers for you. Um, his later career, and I call them the the last 13, because sadly he had 13 years after uh, the Adams family, and then he passed away from complications in surgery. I believe it was Mount Saint Time the Sinai uh, Hospital, and he uh, passed away in '79. But the wild, 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 wild west, the wild, wild west. I always forget how many wilds there are. That was Richard Peel. That was Richard Peel. Yeah. Yes. Um, again. again, yes, that's all right. Um, I'm trying to think of some other. I, I do have one question. Yes. I saw a, a short the other day. When, did he dance? Was he known for dancing? Oh, or, yes. You know, they had the twist contest with him and with Morticia and Wednesday. That's right. There were a couple of episodes where he's featured dancing, and the, and the, the one that's just so lovely is when he's dancing. Little Wednesday. It's just wonderful. Lisa Loring. Um, and that's that's just a classic. It's just so wonderful. Um, it reminds me of the same charm you get watching, uh, I believe it was Bill Bojangles Robinson and Shirley Temple. Just, just an adoring, wonderful thing to watch. Um, and uh, dancing. So Ted also trained in dance as well, uh, not not as a formal dancer, but certainly in his theater program, he would have learned something about dance and movement. And uh, you know, look at him, and you can watch anything that he's in. He just moves really well. The remarkable thing about Lurch dancing is that Ted Cassidy realized that he needed. This is Ted Cassidy was someone who could move very well and dance very well, but he, he was playing Lurch, who was not a dancer. So he needed to appear. He needed to appear as though he didn't know what he was doing, and he was trying to learn from the bottom up. And man, that's that's extraordinary. It's hard to do. Yeah. Was he ever on Broadway? No. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Ted really enjoyed his academic theatrical career, in, uh, particularly at Stetson University. Um, he did a few Shakespeare one-man show type things that he would tour. He did a little bit of that. Never appeared on Broadway. By the time, you know, by the time 1964 rolled around, he had really focused his attention on film and TV. And he moved to Los Angeles with his family and that's you know, the rest is history. But he, he did revisit live theater just a few times. Ron Johnson. Ron Johnson, yeah. No, no, no. Tiffany, Tiffany's daughter, you know. I have to find this out here because um, uh, this, this man was a producer, big time producer in Hollywood. His name is, here we go, here we go. Noel Marshall, ah. Noel Marshall. So um, that's when Ted befriended Noel Marshall and Tippi Hedren. And what's extraordinary is that Tippi Hedren is, I shouldn't laugh, she's still with us, bless her heart. It's unbelievable, you know. You talk about these people around Ted's life, they're all gone. And we can talk about Miss Hedren in the present tense. Um, Yes, yes, and John Aston as well. John Aston's 
still with us. Um, so, yes, yes, yes. Um, he worked on the Herod experiment, and he also got involved in, I, I think it was a film called Aurora, and I think he helped to write, he co-wrote the screenplay for Aurora. Aurora is amazing. Yeah, yeah. That. And that, of course, yes, and that's Tippi Hedren and Noel Marshall, they're big right. Tiger Project lions. Melanie Griffith almost getting her scalp bit off. Yes, yes. Um, that's wonderful. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the fun stories. You all know that uh, when he's in uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid in the knife fight, and uh, he gets uh, wrapped in the yarbles at one point, and it was real. It really had a poem and it just laid right in there. They went through how it was supposed to happen, and uh, it's it's called napping, and it's really very simple. I used to do a lot of stage combat back in the day. But if the the man receiving the kick to the groin um, blades himself, spreads the legs, the other person who's delivering the kick can take the front of the shoe and just hit the inside of the thigh. And you get that nice pop sound, and it's safe, and um, presumably, and that's just not what happened. Um, when it came time, Paul just laid it in. So the reaction that you see on film in that take was real. And that's that really Melanie Ebors, Tom Duke. Say again? Was Melanie Ebors, Tom Duke? You know, that, that, I don't, I, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to go with, uh, just based on an anecdote I heard at DragonCon years and years ago about him accidentally at one of those uh, like desert road rallies things, uh, driving his car into the tent of the person who was going to the store. I'm going to go with slightly clumsy. Yeah, but sounds like something Newman would do. Yeah. Well, plus he played practical jokes. He oh, did as well. They all did. Yeah. Yes, this is true. Um, speaking of practical jokes, here's a fun story you'll find in here as well. Um, when Ted was cast as Rock, and we all love Rock from. Uh, uh, what's the name of the episode? It's... What are those girls names? Thank you very much. I knew someone would know. <laughs> um, so, Ted was all dressed up in the costume and the makeup as well. And they hadn't done... I think they, had, they were taking a break from shooting. Gene Roddenberry had scheduled a meeting with a man from Korea who had some uh, fabric samples. And, you know, you're going to do a TV show, you got to look at fabric samples for costumes. So he brought in his suitcase and everything else. He's waiting in the lobby. And at the last minute, Gene Rod Mary is peeking through the door. He's looking out into the lobby. And Ted was in the office at the time. And there were a couple of other gentlemen in there as well. And Gene turns to Ted and he says, Ted, how would you like to be me? And Ted was like, I'm Love to be you, Gene Roddenberry. That would be awesome. <laughs> so he said, "Do me a favor. Let's switch places. You sit behind my desk, and I'll be your assistant or something." And uh, you're Gene Roddenberry. Because the, the guy had no clue what Gene Roddenberry was supposed to look like. So he came in, had this long discussion and pitch session with Ruck, <laughs> who he thought was Gene Roddenberry. And at the very end, everyone just exploded in laughter. And you know, reveal the prank, and the guy loved it. The, the uh, salesman thought it was funny. But imagine if you look at Ruck, the amount of crazy eyeshadow and everything. I mean, he looks like someone from Paris is Burning. I mean, it's really a full-on um, makeup that, that makes him look somewhat androgynous as well. Um, Sean Cassidy has the funniest story about Ruck, though, and I love this. He said that that costume and some of the makeup and the prosthetics stayed in their home for years after that was shot. So that when Sean was about seven or eight, he went to school one day where they were having a costume contest. And his father dressed him up, and they had to do some changing because it would drag the floor, of course in the, the actual rug costume that was worn on Star Trek. Same thing with the makeup. They did the full makeup with all the appliances and everything else so that Sean looked like 
a mini, you know, like a, you know, like a miniature version of Ruck. And yeah, and so Sean was like, the upshot of that story is that he entered the contest and he didn't win. Wow. So he's dressed as Ruck, as perfect as you could get it from everything that was used in Star Trek and someone else won. But then he reminds us that they grew up in LA. I mean, every, all the kids, everybody had famous parents. You know, so Sean and his sister Cameron, they were very used to a lot of that going on. They would go to parties and they would, they would see Mel Blanc and Mel Blanc would do voices and everything for free, just to entertain the kids. Um, there were always stars and celebrities around. And um, the greatest thing and the greatest takeaway, I think, from the book is that even though Ted became an actor and a performer in Hollywood, California, he lived a life that was free of scandal. There's not a single thing you'll find about anything scandalous regarding Ted Cassidy, none whatsoever. Uh, the closest you'll come to finding anything like that is just maybe he might have lost his temper every now and then when being called lurch out in public, that can get old after a while, um, sure, and being, you know, misidentified with Richard Keel, you know. So those things happened. But for the most part, he was uh, a great person, we say. Nice guy, wonderful father. Um, um, how are we doing on time, gentlemen? Ten minutes. Okay. Um, would you like for me to read just a wee bit? I have just a little, a little piece here. My friend Rachel Shy is here. She was like, are you going to read from the book? I said, I don't, I don't know. We'll see. Um, While you look for your page, I got here late because that was all right. Yes. Sir. What made you decide to write a book about Mr. Cat? You know, I was... Um, this took place in March 2020 when we were wow, going yeah. through the, the pandemic um, and then had some a lot of time on my hands and as I explained to everyone else, I was looking for a book on Ted Cassidy and it didn't exist, so I decided to write it. Um, took me four years, but it was an enjoyable four years, I will tell you that as well. All right. Um, Are you working on a new book? I am indeed. Funny you should ask. I love talking about my new books. There are two that are neck and neck right now, and I just, I don't know which one I'm gonna put on the back burner because I like both of them so much. We can vote if it will help. And that, that, thank you. <laughs> yes. um, the first one is called A Vampire on Mercury, and it is nonfiction. It's about Orson Welles and his 1938 radio oh, yeah. play, Dracula. So, yes. Oh no, I'm voting for that one. Oh, very good. Well, yeah, most people would say, oh, that's it. You gotta do that one. Um, and this Dracula he did uh, in July, so that was just a few months prior to a more well-known radio play that Bruce Wells did in uh, yeah, War of the Worlds. So the read, why should I write about this that's more obscure? Well, because it's Dracula, first of all, and I love Dracula. It's horror-related, so I'm able to get the genre and Orson Welles in one place at one time. I uh, love Orson Welles. And, um, because, you know, it was eclipsed by War of the Worlds. And Orson Welles felt the same way about it. When he was pressured by the press, right the day after, uh, it was November 1st, um, he said, look, I know that you're all surprised that I did this, and I, I just, you know, they were like, well, don't you feel, how do you feel about the craziness and the fact that now you could be in trouble? And he was like, well, I wish I'd had all this trouble back when I did Dracula, you know? So he would love to have done something that had the same impact as uh, the Tom Browning Dracula. He really wanted people to feel as though they were experiencing something that powerful. And later with the War of the Worlds, they did it for odd reasons, as we all know. Uh, the other book is on the making of the blob. Oh, wow. So they're really, really different. Yeah, we're so still- Steve, uh, Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was, I'm sorry, yeah, 1958. I, I'm still with Dracula and Orson Welles just because I'm Dracula and Orson Welles people a lot more than I'm the Blob people. But I'm well, 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 I love it. This is great. I need to take a We need to have a look at it. You're very good. 
Okay, um, let me see if I can find this last little bit here. This will be a nice thing to close on if I can find it. You would have thought I would have marked this earlier, but I did not. So, um, They really, really do. You're right. And I'm giving away free bookmarks to every purchase, by the way. Um, yes, it did. Yes, he played the piano. He took lessons from Polly Malone. Funny you should ask. And uh, Polly Malone was one of those, uh, you know, school mom type piano teachers, and he learned from her. He was then able to operate the harpsichord on TV as though he were playing, but um, but that's not him. That is, um, I haven't had enough coffee. Oh, the man, uh, Vic Mizzy. Vic Mizzy did the music for that. This is the epilogue. It's called Heroes Never Die. And so it was, 1966 had drawn to a close. James Van Heist summed it up nicely in an Adams Family Reveal, 1991. When all was said and done, it wasn't the differences between the Munsters and the Adams family, but the similarities that got them both canceled during the same bleak week in 1966. It was just too much of the same as far as the public was concerned. They were tiring of camp. Both shows had been very popular during their premiere year, but that popularity quickly diminished, aided by the over-proliferation of Munster and Adams family merchandising. Years after both shows had gone off the air, John Aston was asked how he felt about his participation in the Adams Family. His response was still enthusiastic, even after so long a period of time. Where do I go from here? A fair question. The answer is this. It is hoped that lurching forward will stand alone as a complete work, if you will, a one-off and an end in and of itself. After all, we've examined the three most significant sections of Ted's early life. One, Ted's infancy through hometown years in West Virginia. Two, Ted's college matriculation into marriage in Florida. And finally, three, Ted's Los Angeles years, the two seasons of the Adams Family, and ultimately ending after the five gigs he did post lurch by the end of 1966. This certainly leaves the door open for a possible future second part biography. Cassidy's continued life and his career in westerns, science fiction, horror, animation, and his foray into grindhouse cinema, all ultimately leading to his untimely death and subsequent internment. One aspect of Ted Cassidy's demeanor and deportment that never diminished was his class, an air of respectable confidence balanced with humility on set or in the public eye was in his estimation compulsory for Ted, the work, not fame, was everything. While he certainly would have appreciated more recognition for his contribution to media, what mattered most for him was playing disparate roles constantly and consistently and doing it well. Mounting frustrations with being typecast throughout his career may have manifested chiefly by an inner conflict that never spilled out into overt or public angst in a professional setting. Ted Cassidy never lost his cool, his class, his calm, nor his sense of humor. He knew how fortunate he was to stay employed in an industry that more often than not was characterized by fickle fortune. And so it was with the mastery, craft, talent, and skilled orchestra of performer Ted Cassidy. His was an aura of timeless old world elegance, a gentleman in every respect of the word. Above all, Ted Cassidy was by all accounts a true gentleman as he came up in the ranks from high school basketball player to legitimate star of the silver screen in the 1960s and 70s. He always proved his worth by the content of his character. He was a man of class, an infinite savoir-faire. Ted possessed these qualities in spades. He was a fellow player, a friend, son, husband, brother, and perhaps most importantly, a father. He is remembered today not only for his unique contributions to worldwide media, arts, film, TV, and radio, but also as a good friend to everyone who ever met him. Perhaps therein lies his greatest legacy. <laughs> All right. Wow, two more minutes to go, my gosh. Yes, sir. Did you reach out to John Aston by any chance? I did. I, I reached out to John Aston. 
In the past, John has helped with books and written forwards and things like that. He is so on in his years right now. He's living a very quiet, peaceful existence in Baltimore, Maryland, and doesn't want to be bothered. And I knew this through a mutual friend. So I worked, was trying to work with my mutual friend to get John to respond. And uh, we just didn't get it together. And you know, at that point, at this point, it, he doesn't need to be bothered by me. I would love to have talked to him. Um, I would love to have talked to Lisa Loring. I spoke to her husband um, just three months prior to her death, her passing. And uh, at the time, they were getting separated. Uh, they had not made that public, but he told me, it's amazing how many people will tell a writer their life story. <laughs> I'm like, don't be telling me all this stuff. At any rate, um, the, uh, they, they separated and Lisa was in poor health and she passed away and, and that was sad. I would love to have spoken to her. I'll tell you who I didn't speak to though, obviously, Sean Cassidy. I have a wonderful uh, interview with Sean Cassidy in here about his dad. I spoke to Cynthia Pepper who played on, uh, I think it was the episode is number nine, season one, uh, The Addams Family Meets the New Neighbors. And so, um, she is also still very much with us uh, from the Adams Family TV show. Uh, Carl Stroykin, who played, you know, uh, Lurch in the Barry Sonnenfeld films, had a wonderful uh, interview with him. He's in here. Christopher Hart, who is the magician who did the wonderful thing on at least three or four of the Sonnenfeld, or I should say the 90s Adams Family films. Uh, great interview with him as well. Um, I spoke to, his name escapes me, but he is the original Lurch on Broadway in the oh. New Addams Family, so that was great to talk to him and just sort of pick his brain about what his process is in playing this uh, interesting character. So yeah, I had a chance to talk with a lot of people, um, a lot of contributors. Uh, one of the contributors is here, Sam Irvin is, oh. is over there. and Sam. It was very much uh, a big part of encouraging me to get this finished. And he wrote some pieces that are in there as well. So yeah, that's the life of Ted Cassidy. I encourage any of you to please, if you have questions or you want to talk more about his career, come by my booth. And uh, we are selling them today at the Amazon prices. We'll see how things do tomorrow. Um, so it's $35 for the soft cover and it's 45 for the hardback. It is published by Bear Manor Media and Ben Omart, and I just kudos to them because they did an excellent job on this book. So I'm very excited. Thank you so much for having me.